Good morning, uh, and thank you for coming. So we'll start right away in the interest of time, and the first uh, speaker on the physiological evaluation of bifurcation of PCI is well known, done a lot of work in this area, is Bon Kuanku. Good morning, Bon. Thank you. Good morning again. Okay, so that the, I searched the PubMed, and I found that the first specific bifurcation PCI paper was published in 1984. And this is one of them. And it is interesting to see that the, it is described as that the first kissing balloon angioplasty was performed in 1981 by Dr. Andrea Grinchi. So since then, there has been a great and significant evolution of bifurcation PCI in terms of devices, procedures, trials, and techniques. But in terms of conceptual evolution, I think there can be a one very simple con concept under this evolution is that the fixing the stenotic lesion will improve the patient prognosis, and we know that the larger, the better. And today I'm going to talk about the conceptual and psychological evolution of bifurcation PCI beyond that very simple concept, starting with the fractal ratio. So there are several complicated math and formulas and laws represents this fractal ratio, but the simple insight under Lying this fractal ratio law and uh, formula is that the D1, D2, D3 are not the same. From this very simple insight, we know that the concept of Corina shift and pot has been established and both were presented during the EBC 2008. And now we use this concept as a kind of common knowledge during the bifurcation PCI. But it, 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 but it is interesting to see the research is about the history of this concept, and the first paper on this Murray's Law was published more, almost 100 years ago, followed by the 1960s association between Walsh's stress in bifurcation segment and pathologic studies, and we know that this really matters in terms of patient clinical outcome. So that the factor ratio is really, really an important conceptual evolution in, in bifurcation PCI. The next story is, you know, very well about discordance between anatomical luminal narrowing and ischemia. So since the publication of this paper in 2005, we have accumulated lots of data that shows that the anatomical severity versus functional significant mismatch. So we are not surprising anymore when you see the FFR value measured at that big, significantly anatomical narrowed branches of 0.85. But what is more surprising to me is in this almost first paper about the kissing balloon angioplasty, they measured intracoronary pressure in both main and side branches before and after angioplasty proximal distal to the region. So that they, it's amazing to see how our you know, ancestors or the pioneers did this beautiful work in the beginning. And the next concept is that the clinical relevance. We've been talking a lot about this clinical relevance because this relevance is very important in bifurcation PCI. We know that the, due to the very high variability in the side branch territory, as in this figure, between 3% to almost 20%. And that's the reason why when we deal with the side branch clinical relevance, ischemic depth is less important than ischemic width or the myocardial mass at risk is more important than ischemic severity. So last year in this two consensus paper, one is KBC, Korean, Japanese, and European Bifurcation Club consensus, and the other is Bifurcation ARC, stressed the importance of clinical relevance. And it is very surprising to see that, actually this is the first paper I found on the bifurcation PCI. And when you see the last sentence of this paper, is that this paper ended up with the relevance of side branch at risk. So they already know in the beginning of the bifurcation PCI, and the pioneers of the physiology, Dr. Gold, Dr. Kirkiri, Dr. Christian Jailer, they already did uh, elegant studies to assess the myocardial mass at risk or clinical relevance of the lesion using beautiful and very elegant angiographic studies. And the last one is a little bit complicated one, microstructure and function discordance. So here is unfortunate case with complete occlusion of all diagonal branches. 
And in the ammonia PET scan, you can see a very clear defect in the anterior wall or diagonal branch territory. So you may expect a zero coronary flow, but in this PET flow, you see that the average flow on, that, on those segments is as much as 1.64. It's not supernormal, but maybe enough to maintain the function. And this is the reason why, in another case of total occlusion of the diagonal branches, significant reversible defect, but even during exercise, you cannot find any regional wall motion abnormality. So there is a discordance between ischemia and also the clinical and prognostic relevance. And I think this is the reason why there's, I believe there's a missing piece in significant side branch puzzle and which I can find that the, in the microcirculation or discordance between microstructure versus functional relationship. And that is one of the reasons why we are now working hard on establishing microvascular simulation model in whole coronary circulation or the myocardium. But it is also surprising that the, all our previous pioneers did these wonderful works. In the paper you see on the left panel is that the anatomical uh, assessment for the uh, muscle arrangement and muscle structure between anterior wall and, and septal wall. So that we believe that the anterior wall, septal wall, both are the same LED territory, but they found that the, there was difference in the structural way and this may translate into the difference in the ischemic resistance and collateral recruitability. So in this animal study, it was found that the same amount of ischemic insult, my uh, MI territory was less in anterior wall in comparison with the septal wall. So since the beginning of the bifurcation PCI, we really made a, a great progress in terms of techniques procedures and devices and trials. And I briefly mentioned the, some kind of conceptual evolution. To some, it may new, but we have to acknowledge that these concepts at least were proposed and established several decades ago, and some are almost a century ago. So my final question is that the, in this psychological evolution map, at which stage of psych your psychological evolution do you find yourself? Thank you very much for your kind attention. Yeah, thank you very much for excellent presentation as always. So I'm sure there will be a lot of questions and discussion. Uh, can we have a microphone for Dr. Lovar? I am very, uh, congratulations for the presentation. I'm very interested by the oldest concept, uh, the one of uh, Murray and the fractal, uh, the fractal ratio. So I think we have probably in uh, in many countries now, in databases, we have the QCA post procedure. We have a dedicated QCA, and we are able to measure the fractal ratio. We have the rule in Korea, which is five, six, seven, eight. We may this this is made to preserve the specific anatomy of the of the uh, bifurcation. But if you calculate the the fractal ratio of this. This is not uh, 0.678, this is 0.6, which is maybe a small difference. So what we can do, we can ask people uh, it, uh, 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 working with big database, with QCA before, QCA after, and the full clinical follow-up, we may see if it's bigger is better or ratio is better. I think we have the potential to do that. And if you, in Korea, in your database, and in many others, I presume. And uh, I, I, have, I am looking at something uh, also coming from you, which is uh, myocardial segmentation. Do you think that uh, having a systematic myocardial segmentation before treatment will help us, especially viable myocardium, will help us to define the optimal diameter for our bifurcation treatment? Yeah, thanks for the very important question, but the, I think it's too complicated and too far so that we have to wait a, another 10 years to be involved at that stage. But the, that will be helpful to assess. But the, it, is important, it is interesting to remind that the, those studies which assess the territory or the territory-based uh, vessel size assessment was elegantly done in the papers published in 1992-93. 
so that the before we analyze the data, I think it's better to look back and review all those data, what our pioneers done, and think about what will be the next evolution in terms of our bifurcation PCI. Uh, Dr. Cook, can I ask you on the opinion regarding angiography-based FFR softwares and the uh, promotion of those softwares to evaluate side branch before, during, and after the procedure, which does not really go aligned with our consensus? So uh, pl please comment on that one. Yeah, thanks for the another very clinically relevant question. So that the previous original NGO FFR Medis system, actually side branch osteoanalysis was kind of the exclusion criteria because they don't have enough data. But recent uh, Murray law based MUCFR, they are uh, supposedly saying that the, it can be feasible. At least it cannot be excluded. But we know very well about the angiographic limitation and the any image based physiology is at quote-unquote image-based physiology. So there's no kind of supernatural way to overcome the limitation of imaging. So that the, uh, my bottom line is it can be helpful, but it will not be as good as a non-bifurcation lesion. I have a question for you. So if you have a clinically non-relevant, say, diagnosed side branch, I'm, I've been bitten many times where we put a stent across, nothing happens. Other occasion, you might put a stent across your patient has severe chest pain, ST elevation. Yeah. So, how do you differentiate which diagonal side branch is very relevant? You know, particularly if the size is your defining factor of intervention. Yeah. So that there are several ways to assess the territory using CT scan and size and the you know length, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But the my message is that the there's a difference. So I'm talking about this relevance and functional test is that the in a stable stages, not in the cath lab. We know that the in, some, in cath lab, even losing small side branches can, causes a significant arrhythmia, et cetera, et cetera. So that the, what I'm saying is that the, whether to do a stenting or not, it matters, but the maintaining TIMI3 is a totally different story. Thank you very Thank much, you. Dr. Ku. Excellent presentation. And it's my honor now to invite Professor Sunao Nakamura respect the nature of the vessel. Thank you. Just talking about a uh, very interesting toy for the intervention of cardiac chest injury. So, how would you treat? This is a case of left main bifurcation region, true bifurcation region. Actually, always we discuss about uh, what kind of stand technique and maybe double. <clears throat> we have uh, two principles. Provision stenting and TK crash, even though <coughs> if we know everything about this. Yeah, so <coughs> maybe we will be agree. Ah. Thank you very much. Maybe you will be agree if you can finish in a one stent in a bifurcation region very optimally, clinical result will be nicer than finishing a two stent. Look at this. This is a true bifurcation region. It's actually two true bifurcation region, circumference OM and the LED circumflex. If we check the IBAS, you can see large black button around 90%. In this kind of se session, we take uh, this year. This is a resurrection of the new platform made in Japan. Very sharp cutter, small cassette, and a high MDU, powerful. So actually, first, we need a test cut. We can see the window, so we can do the easily test cut, and then confirm by IBAS. Need to confirm what you have done right or not. And further cutting, need to check, maybe every 10 reduction, need to check how much black burden already removed and still safe or not. And finally, less than 40%, then DCB stand, stand, no overlapping stand. 
So this is uh, after the finishing, the no overlapping scan. Number two, true back edge region, the distal or uh, distal left man. You can see this is an uh, IBUS, big flap body without obvious calcium. And left man to the LED, cutting gradually, left in the circumference, uh, finally, black burden going to the 40%, and KBT with the DCB. Black burden going to the 90% to the 40%. This is the Trevor's follow-up, actually very beautiful. So this is the rationale of the DCAB strategy, decreasing the number of the stent in the left and true back and show area, possibly avoid overlapping to stent. And also, quick discontinuation of the antifluid therapy, maybe patient with a severe thrombocytopenia, patient with metal allergy, maybe be nice. We already have uh, some feasible study DCB following a rotor, following a DCA. Respect the basis, uh, basic nature. This is uh, uh, Dr. Nakajima, my junior. So his achievement, OCT follow-up study after the DCAB strategy. This is the uh, OCT follow-up study, DCB following DCA. Pre and post. And this is a representative case of the favorable healing. Actually, more than 90%, 95% case, we can see the, like this picture. Six of, uh, uh, five, or, uh, five among the six case, uh, 60 case, we have a listenosis. I'd like to show the representative one. This is an unstable antenna. So actually, plaque area uh, 85 to the 45%. And you can see this. Uh, surface irregularity uh, and the distorted shape of the lumen. Surface of vessel is uneven and the stratum like appearance. Maybe microchannel, micro mature healing event, maybe associated with the TLR. So, next case is also the unstable antenna. Plaque burden 90% to the 47%, no deep cutting. And you can see the surface irregularity, the distorted shape of the lumen. Surface of the vessel is uneven and the stratum like uh, appearance, maybe, maybe the multiple healing event, microchannel, and also microhemorrhage between the layer, maybe associated with the TLR. This is a third case, actually, the no deep cutting, and the black area going to the 40%. Also, we can see the surface irregularity, distorted shape of lumen, surface of the vessel is uneven. Excessive, so you can see the uh, excessive layer formation. Maybe I think this is another mechanism. So we suppose this total shape of lumen, uneven surface, stratum like appearance, might cause uneven end uh, terrorization, which means uh, resulting in much uh, healing. Actually, I said the five of the six cases. About the remodeling process, this is the IBAS follow up study. This is uh, Dr. Ox's achievement. This is a case of uh, best remodeling after the DCAB. Anyway, pre, post 18, uh, 18 months follow up. You can see this best area 29 to the 31, and then uh, 25. Remodeling index is uh, close to the one. And this is uh, another case on pre, post uh, 18 months follow up. You can see this is uh, IBUS, the best rate is 10, and uh, 16 to the 15. The modeling is 0.99. This is the IBAS cross section area. You can see that this is the original lumen, a black area, and a stretch lumen, uh, uh, cut, uh, cut plaque. And actually, the very small part, but the negative reverse remodeling. You can see the negative reverse remodeling and the positive reverse remodeling. So, this is the best area change. Maybe I think this is much easier to understand. This is the best remodeling index after the DCA plus DCB. Uh, you can see the both positive and the negative remodeling region seem to return to the normal size. Actually, uh, this is in uh, 59. So we believe, we want to believe DCB from DCA combined therapy for leaving nothing behind may lead. Actually, DC, DCAB potential reverse remodeling toward the normal vessel size in both positive and negative remodeling region at baseline. Actually, 
I just remind us some, like uh, 2017, Patrick Schles, you know, uh, reported that the artery remodeling after the BBS and the metal extent, reverse remodeling. And also, I uh, just remind the million study, this is the Osaka University study, aggressive lipid and blood pressure lowering, merely the reverse remodeling. So my second rationale is that DCAB makes the best so can move very freely, whatever he wants. We still actually, we need more data. Are we still on the way to sort of the unclarified validity and the effectiveness of the DCAB? Thank you very much, attention. Thank you very much, Prof. Nakamura. Uh, any questions from the panel? Please. Uh, thank you, that was uh, um, really innovative. Um, for somebody who's new to this technology, there's a, there's a couple of questions. Technology, um, about the DCA. Yes, um, that, that comes to me in terms of uh, the, the simplicity, in terms of we're actually gonna cut out the atheroma and then drug a looting balloon. Uh, sounds, sounds amazing, but it does worry me about putting a, a, a mechanism that cuts inside the coronary artery. What are the risks uh, with the procedure? And also, um, I'm assuming there's only certain subsets um, in which this technology works in terms of uh, it, it looks quite bulky, um, it wouldn't work on calcified lesions. So what are the, uh, the risks and what uh, particular lesions are you targeting? First of all, if you want to answer the, your question, maybe it takes uh, 30 minutes. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, anyway, uh, we have a DCA 30 years ago, maybe around 30 years ago. At that time, just the timing of the launching of the stent. And the DCA and the stand. So they fight and the clinical trial. And the DCA fail. So actually at that time, the you know, the profile of the DCA is pretty much big. And not so actually bulky devices. And uh, at that time we don't have a DCB. This is uh, another point. And actually the some Japanese guy very much you know like the DCA asked the Japanese company to made it. And finally, five to six years ago, we made it. Very smart one, sharp one, very high, you know, uh, high speed one. And this is very user friendly. So even the circumference area, we can, you know, uh, advance in. And the one big point is uh, this is, uh, if you want to use this, uh, we need a uh, pretty much you know, sharp eye of the IBAS and also the, some learning point. This is uh, maybe I think uh, some difficult point. Uh, Dr. Nakamura, do you have data on the type of DCB that was used, Sirolimus versus Paclitaxel? Uh, unluckily or unluckily in Japan, we, don't, we have only, you know, Paclitaxel. Paclitaxel. <laughs> okay. So having used the Simpson catheter many, many years ago, yeah. Uh, this is a modification, right? Yeah. So are your guiding catheters smaller now? I mean, we used to use... Seven French. Seven, oh, really? Yeah. Seven French. And do you have an ultrasound attached to it, or is it a, on the scatter or, to, or not? So I must say, you know, different. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, Dr. Buran. Yes. Uh, I mean, I remember the papers of Lansky comparing stents and uh, DCA uh, many, many years ago. Uh, the technology always coming back new opportunities, new imaging modalities. I'm, I'm not necessarily convinced that you should not use it only without stents. Uh, there is a heavily fibrotic lesions that yeah. have a terrible recoil yeah. after putting a stent. You're struggling to get the stent size the right dimensions. And uh, with I imaging, I believe you, using this uh, combination uh, will be able to perform DCA, polarizacy is coming, we may get more, more opportunities to understand better collagen content and distribution and uh, use it in combination with uh, the, uh, drug eludic stents. Definitely there is space. What about the amount of calcium that allows you to perform a DCA? You would, do not have this technology in uh, Europe, unfortunately. So How much you, calcium do you Yeah, need? if you can see the calcium, you know, superficial calcium, we cannot use uh, DCA. This is a very big weak point. Thank you very much. Excellent presentation.
So we need to move to the next presentation, which will be by Dr. Chang Wook Nam, and he will talk about how to treat 001 bifurcation lesions, one versus two stand strategy. Please. Thank you, Chairman. It's my great honor to have a chance to share my experience with all of you, especially it's a wonderful EVC 2023. So I'm talking about the side branch opening after, uh, oh, this is a, uh, it's not that not the, the second presentation. Oh, no, <laughs> not a big issue. So yeah. I will present the second, yeah. second, yeah. second one first. Yeah. Okay, yeah. yeah. Ah, okay. So this is a, a presentation about the design of a cross Corbis randomized trial. So side branch opening after main basal crossover standing. So I'd like to start with a, a case. So this is a RAD bifurcation reason zero one one reason, but the the diagonal branch has moderate stenosis. So in this case, usually uh, we prepare the provisional approach. So just a, a simple cross of stenting and additional uh, posterior. And this is the result of the uh, simple cross of stenting. So there is a, some pinched uh, stenosis, uh, gelling of a diagonal branch. So whether treat or not, there is a, a still a very a controversy in next step. So indication of coronary vascularization, usually there should be an angiographic target region, and also there should be some ischemia. And also, Dr. Gu already mentioned that there should be some enough mitochondrial burden for the treatment of revascularization. So already know that there is uh, some discrepancy between anatomy and functional significance in jail side branch after main vessel stenting, and also Already uh, see the, the result, there is the incidence of clinical real relevant side branch is uh, not so frequent in real world practice. So indication of uh, additional procedure in jailed side branch, uh, it is very difficult to decide actually. So, and there is another issue about the residual uh, strut of a uh, side branch ostium, protein strut. So you may see that this kind of uh, uh, fixture that penetrate restenosis after crossover stenting of main basal. But when we analyzed uh, from the COVID-3 data more than 2,000, around 2,200 patients with simple crossover stenting, uh, the recent target region revascularization event in between the simple crossover or side branch opening was not different. And what we concern is whether the relation of side branch uh, ostium related target basal revascularization event even though you uh, do the side branch opening or just a simple crossover standing, there is no difference between group. And also the outcome of strength strut opening in jail side branch in non-left main bifurcation, there is a uh, several small studies, Nordic bifurcation study three in 2011, they include uh, uh, around uh, 500 patients no difference with a routine kissing or simple cross of live alone. And also cross study from Korea, 2015, included 300 patients, even though it's a small study, but it's the same result. And this year, a case trial was presented at Europe PCR. They include uh, 600 patients and randomized uh, whether side branch opening or not, but early outcome was not different. But main issue is that the previous uh, clinical trial showed the routine kissing balloon or liver alone, even though they include uh, non jailed side branch. Nowadays, EBC uh, accepts that liver alone strategy if the side branch is not jailed after simple course of stenting. So, uh, this is uh, not, some doctor believe that this is not indication for kissing balloon. And then about the side branch time at the small side branch was also imp uh, involved, uh, included in the previous study. And then very small sample size and no core QCA analysis mm -hmm. and no long-term clinical outcome. So we need another uh, clinical trial for, to improve, to find out the re real result. So our primary hypothesis is that the simple course of stenting would be non-inferior to side branch opening strategy in the risk of target, vessel, uh, uh, target reason failure in patients with angiographically compromised side branch, visually side branch stenosis more than 50% after provisional main vessel stenting 
for none left main bifurcation reason. So inclusion criteria, side branch should be uh, larger than the 2.3 millimeter is uh, kind of a treatable side branch and an angiographically compromised side branch usually more than 50% stenosis after uh, provisional main basal stenting. And exclusion criteria is a, a elective two stented strategy needed reason or after simple growth stenting, timipro, side branch timipro decrease or side branch dissection more than type three. And also visually uncompromised uh, side branch also excluded. And our primary endpoint is target reason failure, composite cardiovascular death, NEMI, spontaneous periprocedure, and clinical derived, uh, clinically driven TLR. And secondary endpoint include uh, many other uh, uh, result. And then sample cash calculation, as you can see, the, the finally, we need each group 500 patients. We, uh, we will include 1,000 patients. If I summarize again, cross COVID trial, we include the non left main bifurcation reason with a stentable side branch. And if need, the two stent strategy, we will exclude. We will observation group one for that reason. And then we will do the main basal stenting. And then if the side branch treatment is needed as a, a timipro decrease and dissection, observation group two. And if there is no compromised side branch, it's observation group three. And finally, if the angiographically compromised side branch visually more than 50%, but TIMI3 pro is kind of acceptable reason, 1,000 patients will be one-to-one -one randomized to the simple just crossover with the medical setup alone or side branch opening group. So this patient was uh, actually randomized to the side branch opening. And we do the balloon angioplasty and the DCB treatment and then kissing again. And this is the result. So still we are doing initial point of this cross COVID trial and hopefully we can see the, uh, the result in a few years later. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you very much. Excellent as always. Uh, if I remember correctly, in the KISS trial, randomization was done after POT, mm -hmm. not just simple sure. crossover. So yeah. I don't see that in, uh, in your protocol. Is POT mandatory or not? Yes, of course. As we are strongly recommended to a POT after a simple crossover standing, but this case is too short proximal segment, so we cannot apply the POT technique. But in protocol, we strongly recommend the POT. Then, after POT, when you did the final NGO, the side branch jailing, then we tried to randomization. Perfect. I, I have a question also. So mm -hmm. we know that uh, just angiographic compromise, it's many times not enough. It sure. doesn't correlate with the functional compromise. So do you classify this group uh, according to the evidence of active ischemia, mm -hmm. like angina symptoms or EKG changes in the group of over 50%, uh, I mean? Yeah, that is very important point. but. Uh, Actually, during the procedure after simple cross of stenting, there is a definite evidence of ischemia. Operator can do the uh, additional procedure. So that can be a decision of, depends on the operator. So we do not do the, uh, such kind of uh, things in randomization, but also we do highly recommend the imaging and the physiologic guidance. But, but the, even though it's lesser than 0 0.80, but randomized to the liver alone, we will do the liver law it, if the patient is stable. So we will want to see the question. result. Can I ask one question? Yeah, sure. it's a great uh, study design. Are you using drug-coated balloon in all patients, or is it just operator's discretion in, 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 in which you uh, go for side branch uh, balloon dilatation? Yeah, that's a very also a very important question. So actually, in the protocol, we do not uh, emphasize about DCV treatment, but the recently, uh, many doctors are very interested in the DCB treatment of side branches, so we highly recommend to use the DCB uh, treatment, but not obligation in this study. Also, it's a pre-specified uh, subgroup analysis. I, I, I don't want to capitalize my position, but it's a very interesting concept, a very interesting study. One point, the problem by leaving the struts uh, across the side branch is that you are not going to have no intima formation there. The, the most main problem is that you have disturbed flow 
abnormal CR rate, not CR stress, which is a predictor of thrombosis. And we have quite a few cases that I have seen living in a, uh, the, uh, the, the struts across the side branch that eventually the patient come back with clot in that branch rather than have no intima for, uh, formation. So it's very likely that um, anecdotal cases, not enough to give you the power for, uh, for, uh, to prove the primary endpoint, but something to consider to have a long follow-up uh, for patient like, uh, for study like this. Yeah, that is another big issue. But yeah, unfortunately, during the last 10 years, we are concerned about that issue. But uh, when we gather from Korean data, actually, the, that kind of problem event was not so frequent. You cannot discriminate whether often or not. So and usually in, it's happening after the first sure. year, again, um, uh, the, the discontinuation of duality platelet therapy. Sure, but the, the depth duration is very important. Actually, your comment is very important. So if we do not often the uh, side branch osteum strut, when we follow up the OCT one year later, most of the stent was covered. But uh, during, until the one year, we don't have enough evidence. So maybe the, until the one year depth, maybe needed in, in that case. Thank you. Thank you. Do you want to present the second presentation as well now? Uh, I'm not sure. Is it can, ready? Can we ask technical team to put on the how to treat 001 bifurcation lesion? Maybe uh, number was five, five, fifth presentation. Zero zero one. While she can, yeah, yes. if you want to. Say. Yes, I just to give a comment. I mm -hmm. think, thank you for everything, but I think that it's not only important to see an angio finding, but yeah. ischemia driven uh, follow up is very, very important mm -hmm. and functional, not only invasive function, but also non invasive follow up. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, that's, that's very important, but yeah, it is hard to uh, import everything in the protocol. So we, we will, yeah, we will do the NGO, uh, NGO scale during the clinical follow. -up. Okay. So if you okay, yes, go thank ahead. you. I will do the second presentation. Yes. So uh, this is a second presentation again. Very thanks to have chance to me to do the, uh, this presentation in the, uh, this EBC. Uh, how to treat the 001 bifurcation reason. Today, I will talk about the five contents of a, a 001 bifurcation reason. The first thing is how many uh, 001 reason are here our daily practice of in sustainable bifurcation reason. So last year, Dr. Mawas showed uh, using the e ultimate registry, including 4,000 patient 001 with 3.5%. So we want to make the, the bigger uh, registry data. So we call the extent by per cap registry from Korea, COVID-2 and 3. And from Italy, the RAIN registry, we include 8,434 patients who are underwent bifurcation PCI. And we found that uh, Medina 001 reason was 345 patients. So the incidence was 4.1% on 001 reason during the, uh, our daily practice bifurcation PCI. So second question is uh, 001 bifurcation reason, the behavior, is it benign or malignant? So previously we have this data from the COVID-2 when you compare the true and the non-true bifurcation reason, the outcome was a poor in true bifurcation means in terms of MACE or cardiac death or MI. Also the true bifurcation reason is uh, worse. So we know the, this data. But how about uh, in this extended bifurcat history about the 001 correct reason? As the same as previous COVID-2 trial, so this uh, extended bifurcat history showed the true bifurcation reason has a higher maze rate compared to non-true bifurcation. But how about the 001 reason? 001 is non-true bifurcation reason. However, the maze rate during three years is 13.9%. Numerically, the highest maze rate in 001 bifurcation reason. So, the anatomically non true simple bifurcation reason looks like, but the clean color outcome is a very complex bifurcation reason in 001 reason. Third question What are unique features of a 001 bifurcation reason? As we know, that the side branch osteum has a negative remodeling. So, it means uh, 
It can be easily recalled and the lesser acute gain after PCI. And also, there is a risk of injury to the main vessel when we treat the side branch. That is also a very important thing when you do the 001 bifurcation using. And because of side branch is smaller vessel size, so we may use a smaller stance size and the risk of a stent failure will be high. And finally, the most important thing, angiographic 001 bifurcation is not always through 001 lesion. As we can see, this is angiographic 001 lesions, OCR circumplex lesion. But when you do the IVUS in this bifurcation lesion, we can detect the ostimable side branch uh, circumplex uh, significant plaque with stenosis. But amazingly, even though angiographically looks good, but this are left main showed uh, caused by the uh, significant plaque. And also the proximal RAD might moderate cash pipe plaque for extended from the distal left main. So at least uh, it looks angiography 001, but I was, it looks 101 or at least one on one reason. So that's why the, the angiography analysis is not enough for the analysis of 001 bifurcation reason. And first question is what are the treatment options for the 001 bifurcation reason? There is a three options always, medical alone or balloon angioplasty, Nowadays, DCD is quite good, and stent strategy. In terms of medical therapy, actually, we know that, the Dr. Gu already mentioned that, the significant clinical relevant side branch, especially myocardial burden, is not much enough. So usually, medical therapy is highly recommendable. And how about the balloon angioplasty with a drug corticoid balloon? Because we don't have enough evidence, but there is a strong and weak point. First strong point is uh, we can reduce the metal burden and preserve the native bifurcation anatomy and reduce the, uh, the risk of thrombosis and the duration of death. But still, there is a weak point, risk of recoil and side branch osteo because of negative remodeling and risk of dissection uh, to extend to main vessel because uh, 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 we need more aggressive treatment before Oh, sorry, the screen, uh, okay, thank you. Uh, during the side branch pre-treatment, there is a, a higher chance of a coronary dissection to extend to the uh, main vessel. And then, uh, importantly, there is a lack of uh, large clinical data about DCB treatment. And finally, uh, when you compare the stent strategy for bifurcation PCI, 001 lesion, one stent or two stent strategy. Actually, when you review the 15 years, Initially, we treated two stent strategy pre country because uh, the angiography 001 is not truly really 001. But uh, uh, coming to recent data, we approach more provisionally in 001 bifurcation reason. And then when you uh, compare the clinical data, uh, the one stand uh, two stent strategy is more common in main, vessel, main or RAD uh, bifurcation reason, mostly nine, more than 90%. But one strand strategy is uh, around 60%. How about the procedural characteristics? More kissing in two sensors, definitely we need. And one strand strategy, uh, more pot was performed. And how about the QCA data? As you can easily expect, the one strand strategy, side branch diameter is relatively big. That's why we can apply the main stenting from the main vessel to side branch. And about the two stand strategy, that's a user case. The reference vessel diameter of side branch is smaller than the one stand strategy. And the main vessel percent diameter stenosis is a little bit higher uh, in sec, uh, two stand strategy. How about the primary endpoint? That's MITVR and stance morphosis compared to one stand strategy and two stand strategy, no difference. So we can select any kind of a stand strategy. And how about the weather opening of a main vessel? Because we put the stent from the one stent, if we apply the one stent strategy, we will stent the main vessel to the side branch. And we can easily think about the risk of a stent, protein stent throat of main vessel osteum. So even though we do not offer that reason, the outcome was not different. When you do the sub-analysis, any kind of uh, circular analysis, there is no difference between one stand strategy and two stand strategy. So ladies and gentlemen, this is my summary slide. The incidence of angiographic 001 bifurcation region were rare in our daily practice. 
But in recent years, there has been, there has been a trend to prepare one standard provisional strategy for treatment of a 001 bifurcation lesion. Although there is no imaging data, the angiographic 001 bifurcation lesion is not always a real 001 lesion. So additional intracoronary evaluation like imaging or physiology will be helpful. The clinical outcome after PCI in 001 lesion appears unfavorable as highest number of mains. So therefore, we have to take a higher risk than our thought. And also, when we decide to treat, it is imperative to consider a barriers of treatment modality when deciding on the most appropriate approach for each case of a 001 lesion, as like a DCA or DCB. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Excellent presentation. Open now for comments, questions. Shazia. Uh, thank you. Um, uh, my question was, I know that the numbers are small, but is there any analysis of, I mean, certainly from my uh, own clinical practice, those sort of lesions I would try to DEB. Um, do you have any uh, analysis of uh, outcomes in terms of DEB versus stent in a one stent strategy? Uh, unfortunately, we don't have uh, the data. Uh, we need uh, some more data in the future. Thank you, Dr. Chang, for your mm -hmm. excellent lecture. But being an advocate for medical therapy, of course, it is a meeting of interventional cardiologists. But in, in schema trial, we have shown that even two vessel, three vessel disease patients with moderate schema doing well on medical therapy. I mean, equivalent to CAVG or PCA. So why are we running after stent or DEVA, etc.? Because the medical therapy has improved so much. So why can't we try medical therapy alone and see in such cases? Yeah, uh, I agree with your, your opinion. So, yeah, medical therapy can be a good option for 001 bifurcation agent in most of the clinical scenarios. Can we have a microphone here? Yeah. Microphone. Uh, thank you for your excellent lecture. I would just like to ask, do you think that the 001 lesions have bad outcomes in comparison to other Medina classifications because of the nature we treat them or because 99% of them are osteal LCX lesions, 001? Mm -hmm. So that is why the results are bad whenever we treat the osteal LCX, whether it is with one stent or even with two stent, all the outcomes of MACE are generally at the osteum of the LCX. Yeah, actually... When you analyze uh, whether the left main, this kind of circ osteo circumflex lesions compared to non left main 001, there was no difference whether you use the one stand or two stand. Uh, but yeah, actually nowadays I believe the non left main bifurcation and uh, osteo side branch zero near uh, 001 lesion. Why we have why we use a selected two stand strategy? Actually, we don't uh, prepared in that kind of region. But this is a study. Uh, previous our procedure yeah thank you very much okay thank you so the next speaker is uh, Carlos Collette on good morning PCI uh, it's lesions. a pleasure for me to uh, participate in this edition of the EBC good morning uh, it's a pleasure for me to uh, participate in this edition of the EBC uh, you know, in Poland, uh, I wish I was there with all of you. And uh, this year, I'm going to uh, discuss about something that we have been developing for the last three, four years, uh, which is the integration of CT in the cath lab, and this approach now guided towards bifurcation PCI. So everything starts actually by by looking at these type of reconstructions that are available. By with every CT scanner, this takes actually two clicks and you get this automatically reconstructed. And, and the people that are looking at these images are radiologists or imagers. And when they see this, they, they their question is a diagnostic question. And sometimes they are unable to answer the question simply because the calcium produces a blooming effect and they cannot interpret lesion severity. But when you show these pictures to an interventional cardiologist, there is a complete different interpretation in light of a different clinical question, which is if this is the next patient on the program on the table, is it going to be a, is a very calcific disease, is a calcified left may, calcific right, uh, right coronary artery, and this patient must have advanced lesion preparation before we actually uh, implant the stent. So 
we quickly realized that when it comes to coronary CT, one single image can have two different interpretations depending on the person seeing the images. And we have learned a lot about fractional flow reserve. And one of the things about CT uh, uh, in the last few years and what we can uh, we have able to understand is that just by looking at this image, again, this is a simple, perhaps provisional PCI with a bifurcation of the diagonal branch, but without calcium. And again, if we contrast this with the previous picture that I show, you see immediately that the degree of complexity of these two vessels is completely different. The other thing that we have uh, engaged in, in is in, in understanding the advantages of these technologies like fractional flow reserve derived from CT and, and beyond the classical significant or non-significant fractional flow reserve, we're actually looking at this in a different way and understanding not only the significance of the disease, but also the distribution of resistance. And then what we have here is on the left side, a vessel with diffuse coronary artery disease that is associated with residual angina after PCI. And then you have on the right side, a vessel with purely focal disease, which is basically the best scenario for, for PCI. And these have been expanded by the development of this tool called the Fractional Flow Reserve, derived from FFRCT, the, the FFRCT planner, that actually enables you to understand what would be the results in terms of improve in blood flow after a given PCI strategy by putting a virtual stem. And the way it works is very simple. This is an iPad, and then you click on, you decide the length of the stem, and then you click on this button called Open Lumen, and then you see what happens immediately in terms of the fractional flow reserve after PCI. Now, I want to also uh, uh, add the morphological component, which is readily available with CT. And what you see now is a different way to characterize atherosclerosis. And of course, all of us are familiar with OCT and IVUS, but also CT offers the possibility of not only looking at the lumen, but also understand the extension of the plaque, the composition of the plaque. And I want to make special emphasis about the ability of CT to assess calcium. So CT is able to assess calcium thickness, calcium arc, and calcium length. And when we compare these tools, uh, this CT assessment, which is on the horizontal axis, with an assessment derived from OCT, you see that CT is perfect to assess length, it's very good to assess arc, and it's moderate accurate to assess thickness. Now, the way that we have uh, integrated this into practice is different. So we're not working anymore with these plain MPRs and crude image. We have actually facilitated the understanding of these geometries by creating a mesh of the lumen, superimposing the plaque in 3D, and then creating some colors to make this intuitive to interpret. And any of us without real uh, experience in CT can easily interpret these type of geometries. But I have to say what really changed the way that we're using CT is the fact that now we're able to embed is in the cat lab. So we have on one side, the information coming from the lumen and on the other side, the information coming from the plaque. And this is synchronized with the CR and that helps us of course, understand not only the lumen, but also the plaque extension and composition during the procedure. And we have learned a lot. We have learned a lot about how the position of the calcium influences occlusion of the side branch simply because the, uh, balloon at the level of the side branch where the calcium is located in the contralateral side of the carina expands away from the calcium and this is one of the factors leading to occlusion of the side branch. Now we see coronary CT complementing intravascular image in a number of ways. You have some of these elements on the screen but I think we have to uh, also emphasize that the fact that it's a non-invasive modality allowing for pre-procedural planning. I'll show you a couple of cases of the trial Look at, uh, so we have here extracted the morphology. This is a patient with a double bifurcation, so left main bifurcation towards the LAD, plus a bifurcation the diagonal branch. You see the distribution of the calcium. Now you see here the physiology of, this, of these lesions, and you quickly understand that there is some pressure losses at the proximal, at the ostium of the LAD, and also at the level of the diagonal. And this allows uh, to plan the procedure. We can derive, of course, the mass and understand which is the serpents that require best protection. In this particular case, of course, we wanted to protect that diagonal. And again, we try to understand from the technical point of view, which is the, the, the best PCI strategy leading to the best functional revascularization, the less, and the other things happening in the cat lab and CT again, help us select the guiding catheter. We go straight forward to the PCI procedure that we want to do. And finally, 
with uh, this software that is in the CAD lab allows to measure length and of course avoiding, for example, doing uh, uh, overlapping stent in front of the side branch. In this case, we did DK crush. Now to summarize, this is all the information that we can extract from CT, understanding lesion complexity, selecting devices, and I'm talking about guiding catheter, but also plug modification tools, tailoring the strategy based on the myocardial mass at the level of the bifurcation, understanding the best angulations to see the osseum of the side branch. This can be done live. And of course, using physiology, not only to assess the severity of the disease, but to understand the pattern and predict the results. Everything that you have seen, we're testing in a randomized clinical trial. We have included around 300 patients in the P4 trial. We were testing this strategy that we call CT guided PCI against an IBUS guided PCI. And this is a, uh, a non inferiority design with MACE as an end. So to conclude, I think that we have moved Ponari CT from a diagnostic tool to a tool that allows for procedural planning including the assessment of the bifurcation angle, flag distribution relative to the side branch, and calcification severity. The three-dimensionality of the disease in the three vessels can be extracted from the CT. And uh, we believe that the addition of physiology is just a plus, informing us again about the presence and severity of the disease in the different places in the coronary tree. And again, the introduction of these images inside the CAD lab facilitates interpretation and the adoption of this technology. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention and, of course, happy uh, to answer any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlos, and thank you for joining us. So this presentation is now open for questions or comments. Do we have any questions? Yeah, Shazia, please. Uh, thank you. Great presentation. Um, I can understand that uh, CT gives you additional information prior to getting into the lab, which will make the procedure easier. But in terms of the actual data um, that you get from IVAS, um, uh, that's going to be the main determinant still uh, of what you're going to do in the procedure. So does the cost uh, and extra uh, radiation uh, that you get with CT, CT, is that justified in terms of the incremental um, information that you receive? I assume that's the, tr the, the point of your study there. Those are very, very good questions. And I'm going to tackle this from two perspectives. The first one is that when it comes to the pre-PCI phase, uh, we believe based on the data that the information coming from IVUS or OCT can be also extracted uh, from CT. And I show you some pictures about the calcium, but we have expanded this. And we actually believe that the way to interpret calcium with CT is becoming so easy that it's, it's, it's straightforward to understand not only the arc, the length and the thickness, but also the location in relationship to the three-dimensionality of the vessel. There are more things about calcium where I believe that CT has an advantage over intravascular images, but I think that will be touched by Dr. Okutsu in his talk. Now, one of the things that CT offers that intravascular imaging does not is the fact that you can prepare for the case. You go to the case understanding not only the disease you're about to treat, you understand the necessity of uh, plug modification tools. And we believe that most of the time, having this information beforehand, we will uh, uh, trigger the use of more intravascular imaging. Now, the second part of your question is very relevant because CT is very important in the pre-procedural phase or before you actually instrument the vessel. But after you have balloon, after you have modified the plaque, CT will not help you anymore. And I think this is the time where tools like IVUS or OCT are very important to understand what is the result of the intervention that you have done. And of course, offer additional information about the next steps during the procedure. But I think most of these things, again, from the pre-procedural part, can also be extracted from, from CT. Christos? Yeah, uh, Carlos, I'm watching your work. It's, it's fantastic. It's very inspiring. It is towards the right direction because you have the data, you have to use it. And um, one thing that um, 
I have noticed quite often from the early days and still working on reconstruction, you have a different vessel, totally different vessel when you do imaging with angiogramosity and when you're putting a wire down. Uh, because you have a total distortion of the bifurcation, the planning may be totally changed. You start thinking, for example, committing a T standing, and uh, then you're realizing that eventually I have to do to, to go to clot because the, the angulation change depends on the amount of calcium and the flexibility of, of the vessel. How often have you seen from your experience changing the planning because of change in the anatomy? Yeah, that's a very good question, Christoph. Uh, uh, and again, I, I think that what, what is nice about ha going to the cath lab with a plan is that you know what you're going to face. You know where the calcium is. You, knew, you know what the potential complications are. And then you have your plan A, you have plan B, and you have plan C. But you have these plans with uh, a lot of information about the DC. So to answer your question, so we do have in the P4 trial, you get a recommendation about treatment. And then we are, of course, following how many times this is followed as we suggest to do and how many times you deviate from that. I can tell you only preliminary numbers because we have a small number of patients still. And I think we are following the recommendations in about 80% of the cases. And in about 20% of the cases, operators decide to do something different based on what happens during the procedure. Carlos, thank you again for excellent presentation. Looking forward to have you in person next year. Yeah. Thank so, you. Man. Yeah. Thank you very much. So uh, this is going very fast. I'm sure all of us have uh, questions, but we are at our last uh, presentation by Dr. Julian Ajif. The pot puff sign and angiographic mark of stent malapposition during proximal optimization, please. Thank you a lot for this invitation. I would start with the presentation about pot puff sign. Uh, first of all, I would like to suggest you, if you have uh, small kids, this reading, because I read it a lot with uh, my children, and it's called What to Do with an ID. And uh, just to tell you the, the, um, the ID, is that an ID of a little boy or a little girl following the children, but uh, the child didn't know what to do with it. And uh, we got a simple ID to test, and that was the simple ID. We have this bifurcation, and we needed to treat by back of bifurcation. And we did the pot, which is really important to do when we do bifurcation. And we, uh, just for educational purpose, we filled the balloon with contrast, uh, not with contrast, but with pure saline. But the balloon is inflated. And we inject the pot, small amount of contrast, and we have seen some leaking of contrast all along the, the vessel. Then we increase the atmosphere and we block completely the contrast progression. That was the idea to test. So the idea was, let's compare the pot puff sign. If we have contrast going through, we thought that we will have malaposition in the pot zone. If we don't have contrast going through and it's blocked, it's a negative pot puff sign, and we're supposed to have a good apposition in the pot zone. And we had to compare it with OCT. So that was the design of the study. When we think about this ID, we said, okay, one third is of our coronary bifurcations or of coronary PCI involved bifurcations. And if we come to the fractal low, I have some difficulty because my eyes are not precise enough to see and estimate the millimeter of each vessel. I'm not good enough to that. And my brain is not enough smart to do this calculation without uh, material. And last of all, it's not always valid. You, you can have sometimes positive remodeling in the pot zone, so it's way bigger than the fractal low. It might happen. So this can lead to a suboptimal pot, malaposition, thrombosis, or restenosis. We build from this ID an academic study, multicentric, 17 particip participating center, and uh, we just perform bifurcation as we are used to do. We just uh, excluded the left main and we performed the pot puff sign. So we inflated the pot balloon, inject some small, small contrast, record it, and see if the contrast is coming through or not. So if it is positive or negative. And after the, at the end of the study, at the end of the pot puff sign, we just have to do one mandatory OCT 
to confirm the sign. And the study stopped there. After that, you can uh, improve your PCI as you want, but the study stopped at the final OCT. We did a cutoff of 200 microns, and these are the essential results. So uh, in 17 experience center, the first thing that we have seen is that we have uh, more than 20% of mala position in the pot zone. So it means that uh, even in experience center, we finish the procedure with uh, mala position. And OCT confirmed that, so intracoronary imaging, imaging is a help for that. And the pot puff sign was really good. We have here the, the diagnosis performance of this uh, sign, and uh, we, uh, seen, we have seen that when we have leaking of contrast, you, you really have malaposition, and if the contrast is completely blocked, most of the time we have complete good apposition. So these are the essential results, 20, more than 20% of malaposition if we do OCT uh, at the end of our procedure without uh, looking for something else. For something else. Uh, we have a clear reduction of uh, malaposition when we do OCT analysis, when we compare the pot puff sign plus versus pot puff sign minus with a decrease of uh, more than 60%. And at the end, I will tell you that the bifurcation lesion are frequent. We use everyday pots, and uh, this technique is simple, it's free, and uh, we can do. Uh, this pot per sign to avoid my position in the pot zone. We did 183 procedures compared to uh, OCT with a great accuracy, and uh, in, uh, it's a feasible technique to assess my position and straightforward. So, sorry for the spoil. At the end of the book, the idea is not to the children anymore, it's for everybody. And I would like to thank all the community for. Uh, for this uh, fantastic work and idea, it was a fantastic adventure for us. And uh, so the study was published in your intervention, and it won PCI Got Talent with the very good skills of Farang and Minfar, and uh, some community sharing in the social network. Thank you a lot. Thank you. Thank you very much, Julian. I have to say for the colleagues here in the room that Thierry Lefebvre actually suggested this topic this year. So he still thinks about TBC and I'm really happy that maybe sometime in future we will convince him to, to, to come. And I would like to invite you all, of course, to submit throughout the year any kind of relevant data that you may uh, submit to us to consider for the next TBC because we really would like to uh, go level up and uh, open EBC, but open to share uh, data, not only the cases. So this year we had great selection of cases. Next year we would like to have some more data to discuss and share. Francesco. Thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I think that is a smart idea. Um, do, do, in your experience, uh, is uh, this technique less uh, um, effective into the left main. I mean, into the left main, we have uh, the contrast that has the potential to flow back. So the, the potential to go through uh, a small mala position can be a little bit less. So it are these cases where there was no correlation uh, related, uh, located into the left main. That's a, a very, very good point, and I would like to thank you for that. Uh, we uh, prefer to exclude left main just due to the uh, intracoronary imaging. Uh, we really wanted to, uh, to have this proof of concept, so uh, we said that we will not challenge ourselves with intracoronary imaging in the left main because we really needed to, to see each strut and each malaposition. In a clinical practice, I use it also in the left main, and I'm clearly convinced about the, the idea and the technique. I think there is no reason that uh, in the mechanistic, uh, you have, uh, if you have leaking through your, your pot balloon in the left main, uh, I, I will systematically go for a bigger balloon to, uh, to try to have the, the full opposition. But also, I think intracoronary imaging is, is also a really great tool if you want to, uh, to have a left main to treat, if you have any doubts. 
Yeah, two questions from the audience. Yeah, please stand up so we can see you. Yeah, yes, thank you. Uh, congratulations for the great presentation, and uh, it's a very good idea. Just uh, have two two questions for you. Just uh, did you experience any malignant arrhythmias during uh, the contrast injection and blocking the LAD, the proximal LAD? That would be one of my questions. And uh, do you use an assist device, or do you have a specific amount of contrast uh, putting in the coronaries, or you just uh, go up as you, uh, you go until you see no contrast moving towards the, the end of the vessel. Thank you for that. Very good point. Um, we did it we, in 17 centers. So uh, we had some centers with manual injection, some with automatic injection. What was recommended is when you film the pot, you inject some contrast. It was recommended between three and five cc, so it's not that much. And uh, we wait uh, for three or five beats. We did this comparison. But uh, if immediately after three beats, you don't have leaking, we considered it's, uh, it's enough. So we didn't face any complications, arrhythmias, or uh, things like that, because we don't do a prolonged spot due to this technique. Please. First of all, congratulations for the great, excellent idea. I mean, yeah. innovation is always welcome, and this is truly really creative. My question is, do you think it would also work with a standard filled balloon, half-half, with contrast? Sure, 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 completely. That was only for uh, the illustration. Uh -huh. You can clearly better see if the balloon is uh, filled of saline, but uh, you can use it without contrast of half saline. It's exactly the same story. We are not looking at what happens in the balloon, but what's going through after. Dave? Yeah, very nice presentation. Do you also use this now for ordinary stent implantation? For stent implantation? That's an excellent point. Uh, no, I don't use it for stent implantation because we think, or I think also, if you have a stenosis and you put the balloon on the stenosis, the contrast will be blocked. And it won't say if you have malaposition after or before the stenosis. So in any case, you will have the contrast blocked because you treat the stenosis. And so um, we are not precise enough to see if you have small malaposition just up front or, or <coughs> downstream the stenosis. That's why we de rededicated this technique to the pot. Might be uh, an idea for the future to test, but uh, we didn't challenge that technique to, uh, for uh, all along stent and all along stenosis. Okay, if there are, uh, yeah, please. Can we have a microphone here? And that was a great presentation and idea. Uh, what was the size of the balloon that you used in the pressure at which you inflated it and then put in the contrast? Sorry, pardon? The size of the balloon. Uh, the, is, was it one is to one at nominal pressures or at higher pressures? What? Well, this is at the operator's discretion. So many centers participated. Uh, you do the, the pot with the balloon size that you want. But me, I prefer really to use the semi-compliant balloon because if I have a positive pot puff sign, so contrast going through, I just have to increase the atmosphere to reach the good size. So uh, that's how we, we deal with that. I don't know if I clearly answered to your question. Julian, no? is it possible to go back to the angiogram pictures and then actually see if, can how I you do Can I have it? the slide back? It may just help. If it's possible. Sure. So here. So balloon is inflated at eight atmosphere. It's 3.6 because it was semi-compliant balloon and it's the same balloon and went to 16 atmosphere and I have four zero. So you see contrast going to the septal and to the diagonal and a bit to the LED. <laughs> and when you do more, you don't have uh, this effect anymore. And it's working well with uh, also a half half balloon contrast and saline, but uh, it's uh, more obvious with pure saline. But it's only to, to show you the, the basic of the technique. Thank you. I know that Yves Lovar is impressed with this idea. It will be part of his presentation today. And I think this will be the beginning of a real clinical practice. Thank you very much, Julian. Thank, Thank you, you all. Well-deserved coffee break, half an hour, and we meet 11.30.